Uh, greetings, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Brendan Shanahan, and I'm a postdoctoral associate here at Yale's Center for the Study of Representative Institutions and a lecturer in the Department of History. It is my great privilege uh, and pleasure to moderate today's interdisciplinary roundtable on the theme of citizenship and denaturalization in the Americas, past and present. Political theorist Hannah Arendt famously described the possession of nationality as a baseline for the right to have rights. But as she also emphasized and experienced in her own lifetime, one citizenship can sometimes be abruptly taken away. Nation states in the 20th century and our own time have continued uh, to strip countless individuals of their native born and or acquired national nationality through laws of denaturalization, denationalization, and expatriation. These developments are, of course, not limited uh, to the past, nor to the United States or the Americas more broadly. Uh, for instance, in the past few years, uh, developments in India have rightly garnered the world's attention as minority communities have become targets of legal and, and political attempts to render them foreign in their own country. Today's roundtable adopts a comparative lens on two different dimensions to contextualize contemporary political, administrative, and legal battles over denaturalization in the United States and beyond by examining developments in previous eras of US history and recent controversies in the Dominican Republic. A quick note, uh, today's talk, one of the last convened uh, uh, this uh, year here at the Center for the Study of Representative Institutions, continues our uh, year-long series of discussions on the theme of presidentialism and executive power and authority in US law, political science, and history. And before I proceed to introductions momentarily, I'd just like to take a moment uh, to say thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made today's event possible, especially our program director here at Jaffrey, uh, my fellow postdoc, John Dearborn, faculty, Stephen Smith and Isaac Nakamovsky, to our presenters uh, and to you, uh, our attendees, for taking uh, the time out of your day uh, to join us for this roundtable. It gives me tremendous uh, pleasure and with deep gratitude uh, to introduce our presenters. We had originally organized this event well over a year ago before it was interrupted just as campus was shutting down in-person activities before the outset of the pandemic. I am thrilled and deeply grateful that all our participants have graciously agreed uh, to reassemble and, and juggle around uh, their calendars to make this work. Uh, our, our fourth participant will be joining us momentarily um, uh, via uh, Zoom from France. First up today, someone who is no stranger to Yale, uh, Dr. Serene Chibaya, Executive Director of the National Immigration Project of the National Lawyers Guild. A longtime immigrant rights advocate in and outside of the courtroom, she has particularly fought in several major cases alongside and on behalf of those harmed by the Trump era Muslim ban, family separation policy, discriminatory police practices, and immigration detention and enforcement. She previously worked at Muslim Advocates, the ACLU of Maryland, and the Capital Area Immigrants' Rights Coalition. Dr. Shabaya's path has been a remarkably dexterous one, receiving her PhD in philosophy from Columbia University and her JD from Yale Law School. Today, she'll talk to us about contesting Trump era efforts to render growing numbers of naturalized immigrants uh, non-citizens and ongoing developments in the realm of denaturalization law and policy in the United States. Following Dr. Shabaya will be Professor Samuel Martinez, Professor of Anthropology and Director of El Instituto, Institute for Latina, Latino, Caribbean, and Latin American Studies at UConn. A cultural anthropologist by training, Professor Martinez is a widely recognized interdisciplinary expert in migrant and minority rights advocacy campaigns, particularly those of undocumented Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic. 
Professor Martinez's work is not confined to the ivory tower. His expert uh, affidavit in support of the landmark case, uh, Jan, uh, John V. Bosico uh, v. Dominican Republic was presented before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in 2005. Professor Martinez will discuss denaturalization campaigns against persons of Haitian origin in the DR in recent years and efforts to contest them. Professor Patrick Vey, research professor, University of Paris One at the Sorbonne, will in turn present on denaturalization jurisprudence in American law in the mid 20th century. An expert in nationality and citizenship law in many countries, Professor Vey is author of numerous books, including How to Be French, Nationality in the Making Since 1789, and The Sovereign Citizen, Denaturalization and the Origins of the American Republic. Professor Vey is also no stranger to Yale. In the past, he has served as visiting professor and Oscar M. Rubehausen Distinguished Fellow at Yale Law School, teaching numerous courses on citizenship and nationality law and history. He'll be joining us momentarily because he is presenting on his very recent book at this moment. And finally, I, Brendan Shanahan, will present on the history of marital expatriation and repatriation in the early to mid 20th century United States. Um, my remarks will derive from a chapter of my own dissertation, uh, revised here as a postdoc um, and history department lecturer. My book manuscript, um, I did my graduate work at UC Berkeley, um, especially compares the legal history behind and political development of state alienage law um, from the late 19th to mid 20th century uh, in the United States. Here's a plan for today's discussion. We'll each be giving uh, short presentations about our respective topics before turning to some crosstalk and then responding to general questions. Should you have any question at any time and you'd like to add it to the queue, please feel free to do so in the Q&A uh, uh, box, and we'll try to respond to as many as possible um, as time permits. Thank you again all for being here today. And without further ado, I'd like to pass the, the baton uh, to Dr. Shabaya. Thank you very much, Brendan. Thank you for this invitation. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, I was very sad not to have the chance to come in person a year ago in April because I am one of those uh, strange birds who absolutely loves New Haven of all the different places I've lived. It's one of my favorites still. Um, but, you know, a small kind of comfort that we can at least do it virtually. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't see people's faces. So I won't know if you're utterly bored and your eyes are starting to kind of, you know, uh, phase away, but I'll try to keep this lively um, despite the topic. So anyway, it's, um, it's uh, wonderful to be here to talk about um, something really distressing in a lot of ways, right? Like denaturalization is essentially one of the most extreme measures that an administration can take against people who are or believe themselves to be citizens of a particular country, in this case, the United States. Um, it's going to be really interesting, I think, for you all to hear from uh, Pat Patrick later on about the history of denaturalization and how it's been treated in the US. So I'm going to sort of back into the topic a little bit and try to stop myself from talking about some of the like, you know, 1960s and, and earlier uh, cases. Um, and instead, I'll just sort of give a look at the very recent uh, kind of manifestations of the government's aggressive attempts to denaturalize people and to use it as a tool to deny certain communities the ability to ever feel comfortably at home in the United States as part of a broader, very racist, um, targeted attack against communities, um, particularly Mlasa communities, but also some others. Um, the only thing I'll say about the history is that over the last 50 years or so, or like, you know, <clears throat> almost the last, like, and up until the Obama administration, denaturalization was something that was actually used sparingly in the most egregious of cases. It was usually like, you know, former Nazi guards or things of that nature where there was something truly egregious that was causing um, the pursuit of someone, not in every case, but like in most cases. And it was really very sparingly used uh, since the Supreme Court had sort of laid some groundwork, essentially disfavoring attempts to take citizenship away from people. Um, that being said, and again, others will go into the history more, so I'll stop there. That being said, since 2008, in the Obama administration, the government started to lay the groundwork for large scale denaturalization of individuals who purportedly committed fraud during the immigration process. This was taken to new heights under Trump 
as his administration did everything it could to discourage people from immigrating to the US and sending a clear message that no immigrant, not even an immigrant with citizenship, can have a sense of permanency in this country. And they did that essentially by taking a very aggressive interpretation of what fraud or mistake means um, in the denaturalization context. Um, just to sort of set the stage a little bit, um, there are essentially two ways that the government can denaturalize someone. Um, one way is uh, through uh, illegal procurement. So um, basically the government has to show that um, naturalization was procured by concealment of a material fact or by willful misrepresentation or because it was illegally procured. Sorry, it's like a two part provision. Um, so either they actively concealed something or there was like some kind of misrepresentation of facts or mistake of facts that caused um, them to, to be naturalized when they, in the government's view, should not have been. Um, there's also another way to denaturalize that has to do with political activities. Um, I won't go into that too much here because I, I'm guessing that um, Patrick is going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so in this context, um, the recent denaturalization efforts um, have really focused on the mistake or fraud kind of element and have tried to interpret that in a way that provides as expansive an authority as possible for the government to take citizenship away from people. Um, the effort that I referenced that, that started in 2008 is called Operation Janus. That's the name that the government gave it. Um, and it was a denaturalization effort that started uh, with the government essentially digitizing old fingerprint data that had been collected on paper cards by immigration agencies in the 1980s and 1990s. The old files were scanned and matched against existing digital records to identify duplicate entries in immigration files in order to identify individuals who may have assumed a false identity or otherwise committed fraud. So you can see this was an active, like they were going to spend a lot of time, energy and money looking through old paper files, collecting old um, you know, paper fingerprints, scanning them, comparing them to current files for the sole purpose of identifying people who you know, they could target for denaturalization, which to me is actually kind of a shocking example of waste of resources by the government. Um, so anyway, the old files were scanned and matched against existing, di uh, existing digital records. And Operation Janus was overtly targeting individuals, not overtly publicly, but like in the, in the documents about that operation that later came to light, individuals from what it calls special interest countries, which have always been defined, like this is defined as countries that are of concern to the national security of the United States and countries that are bordering those countries. And this has always disproportionately involved targeting people from Muslim, Arab and South Asian communities. And has furthered the narrative that immigrants, including naturalized US citizens from those countries or with ties to those countries can never be fully American. So Trump took the groundwork that the Obama administration laid with Operation Janus and significantly expanded and further weaponized its reach. Operation Janus involved into, evolved into something called Operation Second Look, through which ICE reviewed 700,000 immigration files going back decades. So we're talking about people who've been living in this country for decades who might have been US citizens for decades. Anyway reviewing those files with the goal of referring people to the Department of Justice for denaturalization proceedings. Um, US Citizenship and Immigration Services um, launched an office that focused specifically on identifying immigrants who they suspected of committing fraud. And because denaturalization cases have to be brought in federal court by US attorneys, you can't just denaturalize someone, you have to actually take it to court, either through civil or criminal proceedings. Um, and I'll make a note, actually a pause to make a note on that front. The DOJ had like a specific preference to do this through civil proceedings because you get fewer due process protections than if you do it through criminal. So like there are many cases in which this could either be brought as a criminal case or a civil case when it's like a, a case of intentional fraud allegations um, or intentional concealment allegations. And instead of doing it through the criminal system, the government you know, has chosen and, and actually had a policy to choose to do it through ci civil uh, proceedings because in criminal proceedings, you are appointed a lawyer in civil proceedings, you are not. 
in criminal proceedings, the notice requirements are much more stringent and in civil proceedings, they are not. And so even though it seems like it might be better or more preferable to be in civil than in criminal proceedings, in this particular case, the government actually chose civil proceedings because they provide fewer protections to people that they are targeting for this most extreme of immigration penalties, which is denaturalization. Um, so anyway, because they have to be brought to, in federal court, the government started referring cases to the US attorneys for prosecution and the US attorneys were deluged. There were way too many cases being referred. The US attorneys had a million other things to do. So instead of backing off and saying, okay, this is a stupid waste of prosecutorial resources, no, no, no. They created a special denaturalization section under the Office of Immigration Litigation at DOJ that would solely focus on bringing and litigating denaturalization cases. So in effect, they systematically expanded the government's denaturalization efforts and capability at every level of the agencies that are involved in this. And one thing that also bears noting is that traditionally US Citizenship and Immigration Ser Services, which is a subcomponent of the Department of Homeland Security, has been much more about the administration of benefits. Like it hasn't really traditionally been an enforcement agency. That has been Immigration Customs Enforcement and Customs and Border Protection, which are the two agents that, that really do more enforcement along with other components of DHS like HSI and et cetera that we don't need to go into here. But USCIS under the Trump administration itself also became weaponized from being a benefits administering agency to also being an arm of enforcement, which is again, I think something to highlight because it shows you the atmospheric effects and kind of the broad attack on immigrants that this denaturalization effort was a part of. Um, the numbers really do bear, bear this out. Um, although it's very difficult to track denaturalization cases, according to re reporting from the New York Times, of the 228 denaturalization cases that the government filed since 2008, about 40% of them were filed since 2017. And then from 2017 to 2020, denaturalization case referrals to the Department of Justice increased 600%. The Open Society Justice Initiative, which actually published a wonderful, like a really thorough and, and excellent report on this, found that 49% of all civil denaturalization cases filed in 2017 and 2018 target citizens whose country of origin is a special interest country, which again are predominantly Muslim, Arab, and South Asian countries. I'll cover, I know, like I'm sort of, I don't want to go over time, but I will cover like a few issues in recent cases just to give you an example of like how this is kind of playing out and what the fight really on denaturalization is. The government is spending hundreds of millions of dollars investigating and prosecuting people for what can be described as like low level fraud in even the most egregious of cases, right? Like a lot of the cases are mistake cases and then some of the cases are really kind of very kind of not like significant, anything that really deserves that kind of resource to be put to them. For example, one common theme in recent cases is of individuals who the government claims have used a false identity or a fake identity in applying for immigration benefits. But when you actually drill down and look at those cases, there are many cases in which individuals entered in the US under a particular name, for example, but then were issued an in absentia order of removal. So an order of removal without their presence, which they may not have been aware of because issues with service of those notices are you know, very, very common in immigration court. Frequently, people don't actually know that there's a proceeding against them or don't know that an absentia order was entered against them. And then later adjusted their status, for example, by marrying a US citizen or applied for some other immigration relief for which they were otherwise eligible under their real name or a different name and eventually got citizenship. Um, and then, you know, one other thing to kind of note in the subcategory of cases is that the different name spellings can often be attributed to translation errors or simply the fact that there are often multiple ways foreign names can be spelled in English. So if any of you like me have a non-English name, you know that when you're transliterating from a different language, especially that has different alphabet, different script, like there will be variations in how your name might be spelled. Like you choose one, but like someone else might choose another. There are actually lots of instances where immigration authorities like spontaneously choose to write a name differently from how it's actually like, you know, written by the person who has it. So there are many, many explanations for why a name might be spelled a little bit differently. And in a case of particular relevance to your community in Connecticut, the person being denaturalized had one letter in his last name that was different in various applications. So it was Mahmoud versus Mehmud. So like it was written with an A in one instance with an E in another. That's like a really silly difference, but that is a difference that became the basis for trying to denaturalize um, 
the person. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are lots of issues with notice of in absentia orders. People often don't receive proper notice or never know that they had an absentia order from an immigration court in their file. So they may not actually know that they're not eligible to naturalize because of the existence of that order. They also may not know that they have that order so that they can challenge it in other ways and then become eligible for naturalization. So like that just gives you a sense of, you know, one broad category of cases, a very common issue that has come up in a lot of the denaturalization cases. Another very common fact pattern <clears throat> is of people who did not disclose the commission of a crime during their naturalization process. But these are almost always people who had not been arrested, charged, or convicted of that alleged crime when they were applying for naturalization. So the government might find out decades later that a crime that they committed conceivably started before they had naturalized or stretched in some way to the date before the date of their naturalization. And then the government goes after them for not disclosing that information. But it's actually very complicated. Like when you look at the naturalization forms, it asks about like any unlawful thing that you did that you were not arrested for. And that's exceedingly broad. Like, I don't know, you know, like conjuring up what that might be can actually be really difficult for some people. And the government has actually come, you know, gone after people for things that are really small and silly uh, in a lot of different ways. Our organization, the National Immigration Project, one of our staff attorneys, who's also a Yale Law School alum, actually, uh, her name is Amber Qureshi, is, is representing someone who has been a U.S. citizen for over a decade, who was convicted of Medicaid fraud two years after naturalizing. But in his plea, it, there was like an averment that the commission of the crime began when he was a non-citizen. He served the, 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 the crime was minor, he served no jail time, he was sentenced only to community service, and the government is now aggressively going after him and trying to denaturalize him, alleging that he committed fraud because he didn't disclose that he had committed a crime when he was naturalizing. And here I will actually note that there is an issue which I became interested in actually shortly after law school and have been sort of tracking down and, and Umber is now doing a lot of work on, which is that like in, in the immigration context, criminal defense attorneys have an obligation to advise someone of the immigration consequences of their plea. But there's like a lot of different issues that come up in many different contexts with that. It's called Padilla advising because of a Supreme Court case called Padilla that made that a requirement. But then in the denaturalization context, it has a particular effect because very few people think of denaturalization as an immigration consequence, right? Like, so even a diligent attorney who might advise you that if you take a certain plea that might have immigration consequences, their mind might not reach to the question of whether you could be denaturalized. And so there are actually potentially sort of collateral attacks and consequences of that based on the fact that you were not advised that you could be denaturalized, which in the case that, that the National Immigration Project is representing is definitely uh, that was the case that the person was not advised that denaturalization could be a possible consequence. And there may, may have been ways for them to adjust their plea so that it wouldn't actually have those consequences. Um, and again, I'm, I'm raising these things just so you see the broad scope of sort of due process issues and problems that arise in this context. Um, when the government decides to put a lot of resources into aggressively pursuing people to take away their citizenship from them. And despite the fact that the Supreme Court has really kind of consistently in ruling on this issue narrowed the limits of denaturalization over the past century, civil denaturalization cases based on fraud are actually very difficult to win. So if the government can prove that you committed, actually, let me say one word about the most recent Supreme Court case on this, which is called Maslanjak. In that case, the government was basically saying that they can strip someone of citizenship for any fraud or misrepresentation regardless of its relevance to the naturalization application. And the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. And this was a unanimous 9-0 decision. The Supreme Court basically said that the misrepresentation of fraud has to be material. Like it has to be a false statement that would actually impact the decision awarding citizenship. And in that way, it kind of narrowed the scope of the ability of the government to pursue people under that, um, under that provision. That being said, um, the word material doesn't show up in the illegal procurement side of the, stat of the statutory provision. And so the government has basically taken the position that when it's an illegal procurement as opposed to a fraud case, there's no requirement that the lie or omission be material to the ultimate decision on naturalization or that the lie or omission be willful or intentional. So people can be de denaturalized for minor, immaterial, inadvertent errors on extremely complicated forms that are very difficult to fill out. I know this because I naturalized and it is not an easy process. And like you, there are many contexts where you could make a mistake, like just a very innocent mistake in filling out all of the millions of questions that you're asked um, in order to be able to naturalize. So 
even though the Supreme Court has limited um, when issues have been before it, the, the way that the government can kind of use the fraud or misrepresentation, the government still continues to try to push the envelope where it can to get as expansive an interpretation of the statute as it can. Um, there is also in civil, in civil proceedings, no statute of limitations, no right to an attorney, and no judicial discretion. If the government can prove that you committed fraud or that you illegally procured citizenship, meaning that you did not meet the requirements for citizenship, it's nearly impossible to, present to prevent denaturalization. And if you are the principal who is denaturalized and like you have a family that naturalized through you, the entire family's naturalization could be at risk. And that's actually a huge, you know, like that is its own due process problem, I think, that raises distinctive sort of reliance issues and other issues where a family might have been living in the United States for decades and then suddenly the principal person is denaturalized and now you have an entire family that is basically homeless. And as um, I think this is referenced in, this, in the OSJI report about this, there, there are people who become stateless in that context because they don't have other citizenship or like, you know, came from you know, there are many contexts where, where that can come up, for example, if you're Palestinian or um, other national origins. Um, so anyway, all of this is a context that, you know, this is an effort that was started under the Obama administration that was essentially put on steroids under the Trump administration. And it kind of remains to be seen what the Biden administration will do. Although the Biden administration has issued an executive order to review the denaturalization policies of the prior administration, you know, it's unclear, you know, what direction that will take or how it will go. And ultimately, the only way to prevent something like this from happening in the future is to actually get a, re a congressional repeal of the government's denaturalization powers um, or place significant limits on the use of denaturalization. Um, so, uh, you know, the only other thing I will say before stopping so that uh, other panels can, can uh, continue this uh, conversation is, um, Again, in the context of denaturalization, I think the different kind of challenges, paths of attack that at least we at the National Immigration Project have taken is we've been doing a lot of FOIA work to try to uncover patterns or trends or like sort of underlying issues in denaturalization efforts. We've been representing people in individual cases where we think that their cases raise some systematic issues like the Padilla issue I referenced or other issues. And we are very interested in also looking at the situations where derivative citizenship is impacted. So like a principal person um, is denaturalized and then there's a family behind them that sort of gets impacted by that. Um, and then of course, I think there's a whole separate set of issues that come up in relation to the um, denaturalization because of certain political activity within five years of naturalizing. Um, that's not something that we've actually encountered in any of our cases so far, but it's something that we're definitely interested in thinking about. And I'm, I think other panelists might, might talk about that. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and, and it's wonderful to be in this company. Thanks so much. Professor Martinez. Thank you, Brandon. And also thanks to Yale Center for the Study of Representative Institutions for organizing this event. And I wanna thank everybody who's made time at this extraordinarily busy time of the academic calendar to be here. My comments focus on the Dominican Republic but bear clearer relevance to issues of citizenship stripping and denaturalization in the United States. For example, days before the 2018 midterm elections, President Donald Trump vowed to issue an executive order rescinding the right to citizenship of US born children of out of status immigrants. Trump was following in the footsteps of generations of nativist politicians who have argued that the use solely birthright citizenship provision of the US Constitution's 14th Amendment was not meant by its authors to benefit the US born children of immigrants. Its proponents say that making birthright conditional upon the immigration status of the parents would deter undocumented immigration. But they skirt the question of what the actual effects would be. And that's the big question. What kind of America would be created if it were to be decided that use solely citizenship is no longer to apply to the children of the undocumented? A real world example that illustrates the dangers of so restricting use solely is to be found in another country of the Americas, the Dominican Republic. Beginning with a similar basic principle of use solely citizenship, 
The Dominican government has gone where immigration restrictionists in the United States would like to go. In the Dominican Republic, a series of laws, court rulings, bureaucratic edicts, and an amendment of the constitution has already excluded the children of out-of-status immigrants from eligibility for birthright citizenship. The Dominican Republic drew the eyes of the world to its migration and citizenship policies on September 23rd, 2013, when the Dominican court's highest court of justice, the Dominican Republic's highest court of justice, the Tribunal Constitucional, issued a ruling, the Sentencia No Seis Ocho, which effectively annulled the citizenship of tens of thousands of Dominicans of Haitian ancestry. The Sentencia 168 pertained to a case that had been brought by a Haitian ancestry Dominican named Juliana de Guy Pierre. She challenged the constitutionality of a bureaucratic edict, widely known as the Resolución 1207, uh, an edict of the uh, Junta Central Electoral, the uh, Central Electoral Board, which basically uh, told civil registry officials in the Dominican Republic to refuse to issue documents to Dominican born people whose non-citizen parents did not present official Dominican identity documents when registering their births. De Guy was born in, 2000, in, excuse me, in 1984 of Haitian parents in the Dominican Republic. And she got to a civil registry office in 2008 with her birth certificate to request a cedula de identidad electoral of the National Identity Card, which is required for a broad range of legal and administrative functions in the Dominican Republic. At the registry office, officials seized her birth certificate and refused to issue her the cedula card. The sentencia of the uh, Tribunal Constitucional upheld this, stating that the Junta Central Electoral uh, had been correct in refusing to issue de guía cedula on the basis of the Resolución 1207. The sentencia not only sustained that de Guy had never rightly possessed Dominican citizenship and may be legally stripped of it, it also extended this decision not only to de Guy, but to all other people who shared her status. And most scandalously, the ruling was retroactive to all Dominican born people since 1929. According to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the retroactivity of the sentencia led to the mass denationalization of over 200,000 Dominicans of Haitian descent, who because they have no other nationality have been left stateless. The Dominican High Court's ruling also went beyond the case brought to it by requiring several branches of government not just to resolve the citizenship status of Haitian ancestry Dominicans, but also to regularize the residency of out of status non-citizens. A special registration process due hundreds of thousands of Haitian nationals to request legal residency, but only a small percentage of these were able to provide all the proof of residency documents that were needed to get a, a permit of, a, of legal residence. Outcomes for those Dominicans who had been stripped of citizenship are even murkier. An undetermined number of Dominican born people of Haitian descent remain stateless, being indefinitely caught in bureaucratic limbo or having given up in frustration from regaining their Dominican citizenship. What lessons then can be drawn from the history that led to the Sentencia Uno Seis Ocho and its confusing aftermath? One is that an official state endorsed policy of minority group denationalization can start small with scattered and badly coordinated local restrictions. Between 2013 and 2015, Texas officials seem to be borrowing a page from the Dominican playbook when they denied birth certificates to the US born children of Mexican nationals who possessed only the Mexican government ID of the matricula on the grounds that the matricula was not a secure ID. That was exactly 
how the Dominican Republic began its march toward denationalizing Haitian descendants. Starting in the early 1990s, civil registry officials began to deny birth certificates to the Dominican born children of Haitian parents. Under the pretext that the Dominican constitution exempted persons in transit from the use solely right to Dominican nationality. As it became clear that this practice could not be defended when it was challenged at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Dominican leaders concluded that firmer legal foundations had to be found for out of the offspring of out-of-status immigrants to be denied Dominican citizenship. Not only was the state not deterred by international pressure then, rather the Dominican state bent to its aims the same rule of law processes in which international human rights invests faith. While the personal security of Haitians and Haitian descendants has no doubt deteriorated, it is through legislative deliberation, the vesting of authorities in courts of law, and textually non-discriminatory rulemaking that the Dominican Republic has targeted Haitian descendants for exclusion. A third lesson is that placing legal residency conditions on use so life will do nothing to deter undocumented immigration, but it will place extraordinary new burdens on immigrant descendants. This reactionary citizenship policy has not chased Haitian descendants from the Dominican Republic. Rather, ironically, it has confined them within the country as a stateless underclass of people who lack the necessary documents to travel overseas, for example, to seek education or employment opportunities, as have hundreds of thousands of other Dominicans. The Dominican case therefore shows that US opponents of birthright citizenship for the children of out of status non-citizens must answer to the danger that their proposal would be ineffective for its stated aim of curbing undocumented immigration, but would create a legally approved hereditary underclass. A fourth lesson then is that we may need a more robust norm than the prevention of statelessness to guarantee immigrant descendants access to citizenship. International denunciations have focused on the flagrant red card wrong of stripping citizenship from people who had been Dominicans their whole lives. But the Dominican state has gotten something like a pass from the international human rights community about a new provision of the added to the Dominican constitution in 2007, 2010, excuse me, which also limits eligibility for youth solely birthright citizenship to people whose parents were legal residents at the time of their birth. So one is a retroactive citizenship stripping, another is a prospective citizenship denial. I think it bears asking why stripping citizenship retroactively is intolerable while permitting certain newborns to be citizens while uh, denying others of this is a legitimate exercise of state sovereignty. As a result, it looks like the Dominican state is once more winning its war against international human rights pressure, even as it loses every battle in international human rights venues and in the court of world opinion. The larger question may be whether it's time to talk about a larger positive right for non-citizens worldwide to claim effective membership in the states in which they reside and work and to which they belong in every real way. Thanks for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor Martinez. Uh, Professor Vey, would you like to, to go next? Thank you, Brendan, and sorry for joining you a little late from Paris. And thank you for uh, adding me to this very interesting panel. So I'm going to talk about the product of a research I've made in the archive of the, of the American archive of the different judges and justices and the administrative archive about the history of denaturalization and denationalization in the United States. So denaturalization was made statutory in 1906 and the 
the main purpose of the statute was to fight fraud at a time where the, the, the naturalization was occurring at state level. And so the statute um, organized the possibility of the federal government suing, uh, going to, to court uh, as to uh, uh, counsel uh, naturalization on fraud and illegality. Uh, very soon, uh, the federal government order a restriction of action because probably one third to 40% of Americans of that time who has been naturalized had not followed exactly the law, either because they didn't have the number of your residence or the age or all the condition that, uh, and, and the implementation, the strict implementation of the law would have created a social or civil unrest uh, and legal unrest in many states. Uh, uh, instead, the government decided to pursue political uh, uh, enemy, I would say, I quote, of course, and the first political denaturalization was uh, of Emma Goldman, the anarchist, who became American by marrying a naturalized American, so they find a way to denaturalize her husband, and she became stateless and, de uh, and deported, and was deported to Soviet Union uh, uh, after the First World War. But uh, adding to that special case, the government and the judges find a way to go after any American involved in politics after their naturalization. Uh, they consider that becoming a socialist or a, uh, an anarchist or an, open, uh, or, uh, or an opponent to the government was meaning a mental reservation, so a violation of the law, a fraud to the law uh, uh, at the time of naturalization. And so on that basis, dozens of uh, Americans involved in politics were denaturalized until a big program was uh, organized in 42 against an Nazi American, at a, uh, but at the same time, a case of a communist reached the court, the court, Schneiderman, and the court decided that, first of all, a naturalized American have free speech like any other. And secondly, to, uh, to denaturalize an American, uh, you, need a de uh, you need a degree of evidence, a clear and unequivocal and convincing that was not always uh, given to the previous case of denaturalization. So it, has, it had an impact of reducing massively the case of denaturalization. Then the government shifts to denationalization. Uh, the, the 1940 Nationality Act uh, uh, included provision that permitted to uh, deprive American born citizens if uh, they uh, uh, um, uh, would join a foreign army, escape the draft, voted in foreign election, and of course the naturalized if uh, they uh, go back to uh, go to live in a foreign country. And this provision, on the on the basis of provision, this provision, the government started uh, denationalizing massively. At that time, you had five thousand denationalization per year. The total of denationalization in the U.S. Uh, until the court uh, with Afroim versus Ross stopped the process is 120,000. And these cases, well, I've studied them in the court, but this, the life, the, 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 what happened to these people has never been studied by massive, I mean, by, by a real study. It's a, it's a massive number compared to other, other democracy. And if you add the 22,000 denaturalization, and I don't count the people who lost their citizenship by marrying American because even the court, the court say it's not a, it's a suspension. So uh, Brendan will talk about that. Uh, but the, the 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 number is huge and has not been really studied. The cases, uh, the life of these people has not been what they began, what they become, etc. So the the first moment where the court started reacting was the uh, uh, 58, 57 term on three cases, uh, Nishikawa, Perez, and Trop. They were very different cases. One was a Japanese American who was forced to, who was in Japan, he was forced to jo join the drafts in Japan, otherwise he would have been killed. Uh, there was Trop who 
uh, left his military compound. He was depressed and came back uh, after 24 hours. And and Perez, uh, I think he was he was a dual national who who had uh, escaped the draft uh, because he was living between Mexico and the United States. And facing these cases, uh, Chief Justice Warren uh, wrote on a memo, a written memo I found in the archives, the whole concept of our government is opposed, I quote him, to regulation of citizenship. Whether the concept was of compact federalism, sovereignty of the individual, or of some other, citizenship is the basic and inalienable right of the individual. When I uh, interviewed the, the clerk of Warren about this memo, he secret me, told me, but now I can share the secret with you because I wrote it in the book, that he, he could not imagine that Warren himself wrote because he was a great chief, but was not a great jurist. And in the words of his clerk, and so probably the clerk told me some other justice. Uh, uh, he was he took he was taking note from another justice when he wrote that, and I found that the other justice was Justice Black, who had a, a, a concept of citizenship. Uh, uh, that uh, who developed in Afroim versus Ross say, almost 10 years later in a majority case that the 14 amendment, and I will read you what he wrote in Nishikawa, which was in fact pre the, 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 the thinking that led to the full protection of the American citizen under the 14 amendment against denaturalization and denationalization. Section first, and that's the word of Black. Section first of the 14th Amendment that confers citizenship and narrows a person born here with citizenship also provides that no state shall make and enforce any law which shall abridge the privilege and immunity of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The first of these two clauses plainly makes privilege and immunity of United States citizenship free from abridgment by a state. The amendment then goes on to recognize the power instead to deprive person of a citizen of life, liberty, or property if they are afforded due process of law. But even if afforded due process of law, the state is, is grant no power under the 14th Amendment to deprive any person of the citizenship grant by the 14th Amendment. So there is a kind of sovereignty of the citizen, the term used by the justice, that prevents the government to even on the due process to challenge the, the citizen born under the protection of the 14th Amendment. So in 57, they didn't want, they won on Trump. Trump is very known because it quoted Anna Arendt uh, because there was one case where they won under the fact that Trump was made stateless and they won a majority of one vote in the, in the court saying, that it was contrary to the to the Eighth Amendment. It's a cruel and unusual punishment. But they didn't want on Paris because Paris was dual citizen, so he was not made stateless. And uh, Warren and Black wanted to find a way of protecting all Americans. And they won in uh, the case of 67 Afro versus Ross. What about denaturalization? Denaturalization uh, 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 had still some provision that could apply, and but progressively, the Supreme Court also reduced the power of the federal government to denaturalize. So, in a very important decision, Congress versus United States, where Justice Scalia delivered the, 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 the opinion, it says roughly that the the you cannot denaturalize for reason like lying on something that would not, with your address or your age that would not have prevented you to be naturalized. And this reasoning was confirmed in the most recent decision of 20, 20, 2017, Massen Lack, that says almost the same uh, uh, for denaturalization organized under a criminal law process. I will conclude here by saying that what is amazing in these cases 
is that contrary to some people, what some people told me after reading my book, they say, you are French, you don't know very much about American courts. When the, when the court will shift to conservative, uh, they will destroy all this jurisprudence. And I say, no, I don't think Scalia was a liberal. And I think he defended uh, the sovereignty of the citizen by being uh, 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 in, in, in ideologically uh, defending the citizen against the power of the state. So you have like a, a convergence between justices for different intellectual and, and, um, and reasoning that guarantee and secure the American citizenship in a way that even if Trump announced a lot of uh, action, uh, it didn't lead to the massive number of cases that were implemented after the Second World War. Hello. Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Vey. Um, uh, the last presentation will be my own, and um, I must apologize. We are trying to keep this in a roundtable form, but I'm going to share some slides because I think they are necessary to help uh, illustrate some of the phenomena uh, that I'm describing. Um, if you give me one moment, I here we go. Believe uh, you should be seeing my slides. Uh, can, Petri, can you confirm uh, my slides are coming through? Great. Um, well, today, they are coming through. My, they are coming. okay, thank you. In my remarks, I'm going to be presenting on the history of marital expatriation, uh, how US born women lost citizenship upon marriage in the early 20th century, and even more so contextualize their efforts to regain uh, their stolen citizenship and citizenship rights as immigrants in their own country. Um, briefly, uh, uh, as many other historians and legal scholars uh, have explored, uh, married women's nationality law in the US um, evolved uh, tremendously over the course of the early Republic up until the 1930s. Here are just a few key um, statutory developments in uh, this uh, US history. For most of the antebellum era, there was no clear policy governing the citizenship status of US born women marrying non-citizen men. And even when the passage of a Naturalization Act in 1855 clarified that an immigrant woman's citizenship status was contingent upon that of her spouse. It did not say the same thing for um, American born women. Sometimes federal administrators interpreted this to mean that uh, women had lost citizenship through marriage through the, the doctrine of coverture. At other times, federal uh, uh, administrators came to the opposite conclusion. That is until the passage of the Expatriation Act of 1907, which among other things, clarified that an American born woman's marriage to a non-citizen man uh, constituted by itself an automatic act of expatriation. Passed at a high time of immigration and nativism in the country, it was designed to penalize American uh, women for marrying immigrant men and to bring the United States into alignment with many other uh, Western countries that had similar uh, 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 coverture-based nationality law. Not surprisingly, the Expatriation Act was deeply unpopular among women's suffragists, some of whom, like San Franciscan suffragist Ethel McKenzie, um, uh, uh, won the right to vote in theory, but was denied in practice because she had lost her citizenship and she unsuccessfully challenged uh, its constitutionality under the 14th Amendment in 1915 before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, upheld its provision, uh, arguing that her marriage uh, was testament, testament, uh, to, tantamount excuse me, uh, to a voluntary expatriation. Following the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, the new League of Women Voters made the passage of an independent married women's nationality law a foremost goal. Um, and in 1922, the Cable Act was passed, which recognized the independent nationality of immigrant women and most native born women, henceforth marrying 
um, uh, husbands of different nationalities, but women uh, who married men ineligible to citizenship at that time, that meant East and, East and South Asian men continued to lose their citizenship until 1931. Crucially, however, neither the Cable Act of 1922 nor its amendment in 1931 retroactively granted women citizenship back to the countless women who had their citizenship taken away from them. Um, instead, those women who wanted to regain their birthright had to do so as immigrants in their own country. What would that process have looked like? Well, here's one such petition filed uh, in a federal district court in San Antonio, Texas in 1933 by Antonia Guerra Lozano. This was not a simple process. Uh, uh, Guerra Lozano would have had to file a petition in a court of naturalization, submit to a background check and answer all relevant questions to naturalization officials, present two citizen witnesses, pay all associated fees, appear before a judge and prove her qualifications uh, her knowledge of American history, uh, proficiency in English, and prove that she was of, quote, good moral character, and then reappear in court to swear an oath of allegiance if accepted. Despite these uh, uh, hurdles, um, many Marilyn expatriates did so. In San Antonio alone, in this federal district court, between fiscal years 1923 and 1940, 139 US born women petitioned uh, to naturalize as immigrants in their own country, representing about 4% of all immigrants in that time span doing so in this particular federal district court. Um, I have examined the naturalization files in San Francisco, uh, federal district court in San Francisco, uh, California, and Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and there, uh, marital expatriates represent about 3% of uh, all uh, petitioners for citizenship in that time span as well. And if we extrapolate from that um, to make estimates of national patterns, I estimate that between 80 and 130,000 marital expatriates were petitioning to regain citizenship in the 1920s and 30s. Um, whether it was to gain the right to vote to defend one's access to employment or benefits at a time when states were passing a host of laws restricting jobs and social services to citizens, to acquire a passport of particular importance for Asian American women during a time of racist immigration exclusion, or the simple principle of regaining one's birthright, um, tens and tens, if not more, uh, over 100,000 uh, US born uh, women uh, sought to regain their citizenship, and most were successful but not all. Um, women who are under the age of 21, uh, folks with uh, different visa statuses, those who encounter procedural hurdles, often mothers with young children who uh, were denied um, an extension, um, bureaucratic or judicial discretion over whether someone met the necessary qualifications um, uh, could all be used to deny uh, marital expatriates. Eight women in the same San Antonio court um, were denied. All of them, however, uh, who were denied in this particular court were Mexican American women on ostensible grounds of, quote, uh, as you can see here, a lack of knowledge or ostensible lack of good moral character. In short, while most women who applied to regain their citizenship were able to do so, this process was not easy nor were the officials in charge of it, making it easier for them. In fact, in 1923, uh, the head of the federal government's naturalization service, Raymond Christ, went so far as to recognize that were Congress to create a separate track uh, to regain one's citizenship through a process known as repatriation, uh, it could be much simpler and faster for these women to regain their citizenship. However, um, he noted that in his mind, this was simply, quote, food for thought, unquote, of the nation's lawmakers. Well, in 1936, Congress decided to do just that for some marital expatriates, passing a Repatriation Act, um, which um, made it uh, faster um, for marital expatriates whose marriages had ended to regain their citizenship. They simply needed to prove that they had been born in the US 
um, and the reason for their lack of citizenship was their marriage to a non-citizen. Um, uh, they did not need to go through all of these procedural hurdles. And between 1936 and 1940, um, 35 women in San Antonio in that same court uh, used these provisions. Um, and in uh, the summer of 1940, its provisions were extended uh, to women who were still married to their husbands. The language of this statute was unnecessarily complex, however. It read, as you can see here, marital expatriates whose marriages has ended, uh, quote, shall be deemed to be a citizen of the United States to the same extent as though her marriage to said alien had taken place on or after September 22nd, 1922. However, no such woman shall have or claim any rights as a citizen of the United States until she shall take have shall have duly taken an oath at any place within or under the jurisdiction of the United States before a court. The uh, federal government's immigration branch, the INS, interpreted this to mean at the time that uh, marital expatriates uh, became citizens once more once they completed the entire process, um, uh, both uh, in 1936 and immediately thereafter in 1940. But shortly thereafter, in the fall of 1940, the INS would reverse course and argue that all eligible women uh, who had been permanently resident in the US as marital expatriates had regained their citizenship by decree, but they remained citizens without citizenship rights unless they took the required repatriation oath. Um, and they did so uh, precisely at the same time as um, marital expatriates across the country were reported by newspapers as, quote, flooding uh, courts asking for accelerated uh, processes to gain regain their citizenship. Uh, the the uh, the INS records uh, are organized under the fiscal year, which uh, begins in January. Uh, sorry, excuse me, in July. Um, and so most of these figures for 1941 are actually uh, late 1940. So here again in San Antonio, we see uh, that the illustration of uh, that quote unquote flooding of the courts. Why would so many marital expatriates want to regain their citizenship in 1940? Well, it's a time of war in Europe, but also it is at a time when Congress was also passing a host of other nationality laws, which uh, ended up conflicting with that repatriation amendment of 1940. The first uh, was an Alien Registration Act, which required virtually all non-citizens to register at their local post office as a national uh, security wartime uh, uh, measure. And in a, a subsequent uh, 1940 effort to codify all nationality laws, um, uh, Congress inadvertently repealed the provisions of this 1940 amendment, though there was a grace period before it went into effect uh, at the start of the following year. I realize this is a lot of information. So in short, the INS was tasked with the prospect of ensuring that tons of women who had been born in the United States as citizens and had subsequently lost it, knew that they were non-citizens, that they would register as non-citizens as a national security measure um, at precisely the time when provisions designed to facilitate that process of repatriation were set to expire. And in that context, the INS administratively declared all permanently resident marital expatriates once more citizens those citizens without citizenship rights. To the courts, however, uh, particularly federal courts, uh, though a few approved of this, many increasingly stepped in to say, this is unacceptable. It is not OK to recognize a de jure category of citizens who are citizens without citizenship rights. Uh, from the US Court of Appeals in Washington, DC, to federal district court judge in Hawaii, uh, Frank McLaughlin, who succinctly argued, we have, ha we have and have always had in our country, but one class of citizens, full-fledged citizens. Now, of course, in practice, this is not true. This is the same time as Japanese American internment, Jim Crow regimes in the South, but it pointed to an increasing uh, link in the courtroom of the ideology that citizenship could no longer be disentangled from de jure citizenship rights. I want to leave it there to, to, to simply um, uh, reflect on two points that I think uh, bear, uh, bear on our current moment and the developments we've been talking about in this panel. 
Um, the first is to say that um, when we are talking about denaturalization, expatriation, uh, denationalization uh, policy, we are dealing with a host of complex and overlapping laws and policies. And even well-intentioned reforms must think about fifth, fourth and fifth order consequences down the line, lest groups like marital expatriates be caught in a web of categories inadvertently uh, of the status of citizens without citizenship rights. And then the subsequent administrative complications wrought by them. But this story also tells us uh, and highlights how denaturalization, denationalization, and expatriation policies usually harm the most marginalized the most in their implementation. And so the presumption of the re retention of US citizenship and its rights are and will always remain of paramount importance. So why don't I leave it there? Um, and we can reassemble as a group uh, and talk uh, together a bit and, and answer uh, some of your questions. Okay, um, I've see, I see several questions here. So perhaps we'll just jump right into them to make sure that we, um, we have enough time to try to answer all of them. Uh, one question asks, are law enforcement uh, set their denaturalization targets preferentially over low income communities or more racialized? Um, what happens to folks once they are denaturalized? Perhaps uh, Dr. Shabaya, you might wanna start there, but if anyone else would like to respond, um, please feel free. Yes, I can start. Um, so uh, as I think um, I mentioned when talking about Operation Janus, the, at least in recent history under the Obama administration and the Trump administration, it has been very targeted at certain communities that these administrations have uh, kind of targeted in other ways as well, like with a variety of discriminatory programs. And it's really been largely Muslim, Arab and South Asian communities that have been the, the focus or the target of let's say overtly Operation Janus and Second Look, even though other people are also included. So like there have been stories of people from Guatemala and other countries. Um, there are also sort of related issues that are not denaturalization per se, but that are about questions around midwife births along the Southern border. And, and that I think covers a lot of low income communities. So I guess what I would say is um, there are various initiatives targeting people who are citizens that really kind of capture people in the sort of low income um, community who live along the border and, and other uh, like uh, there's kind of issues with the Yemeni community getting passports and verifications of birth certificates and things of that nature. Um, but as far as like the specific denaturalization efforts, I do think that the largest chunk of those efforts and the way that they've been described in the special interest countries that are always kind of the focus of attention, at least for um, the Obama and Trump administrations have been Muslim, Arab and South Asian communities um, or countries with those um, kind of with populations that are predominantly so. Um, the, to the question of what happens after someone is denaturalized, you basically revert back to the status you had before you naturalized. So for some people, that means reverting back to being a lawful permanent resident. For others, you might lose your status if you didn't have status or if your status is otherwise at risk. Or even if you are a lawful permanent resident, there are certain crimes that make you deportable even as a lawful permanent resident. And so you might revert back to that status and then the government might pursue deportation proceedings against you, which presumably is what happens in most cases because otherwise why would they spend all this time denaturalizing you? Um, so that is kind of my answer. I'm sure others might have other insights to add to that. And I, I will just add, reiterate, uh, historically, uh, having looked at the, the consequences of marital expatriation uh, on a sociodemographic level in, in three different regions, um, and building on a lot of previous great scholarship um, about the effects of marital expatriation. Um, again, it's, it's the most marginalized who are most harmed back then as well. Uh, so racialized communities um, th through de jure and de facto implementation of the policies, and then their intersection with um, uh, provisions restricting access to resources uh, for, for those who are poor 
um, a, a occasional deportation of, of, of people owing to public charge statutes, um, among others, um, from 100 years ago to 80 to 70 years ago. We have another question for both um, Dr. Shabaya and uh, 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 Professor Martinez, um, which I think really puts the two in conversation, which is what kind of advocacy is needed right now in the US to prevent us from the incremental and drastic narrowing of citizenship for communities of color, as in the Dominican uh, Republic? Well, I, it may sound banal. And by the way, I lost power. So I'm connecting through um, data right now. <laughs> I hope I'm still visible and audible to you guys. You are. Thank you. There's Thank just you different technology. Sure. Maybe it's better than before. Uh, it may sound banal, but constant vigilance. Um, you, you know, and definitely the Texas cases and the way in which litigation was brought promptly on behalf of uh, the parents and children who were being denied a nationality by being denied a birth certificate in Texas uh, is exemplary of the way in which uh, uh, prompt legal action in the United States can uh, be effective in turning back these kinds of denationalization efforts. That said, if the political will crystallizes in the state and its leadership, there, the Dominican case suggests that there are limits to what the international community can do. Uh, because the state always has the legal uh, escape hatch, if you will, of saying that, in fact, nobody is being denied uh, a citizenship because they can claim citizenship in the countries of their parents' birth. Uh, even as uh, those people who have been stripped of Dominican citizenship have very precarious claim to any of the most basic rights of a, a, a human in the modern <laughs> world, right? You can't uh, uh, register for a uh, university. You can't uh, uh, take up uh, legal marriage or, or uh, register your, um, your property legally without that kind of identity documents. So you certainly can't get a passport uh, or you know, if you cannot validate your uh, citizenship in Haiti, for example, which is a very, um, you know, real possibility that and it seems to be affecting tens of thousands of people in Dominican Republic because their parents too literally didn't don't have the documents to ascertain where they were born. So the Haitian government has been fairly liberal and accommodating, uh, but then, you know, the questions may arise as to how uh, effective in a world of, um, you know, highly uh, um, unequal power for different passports, how effective it is to be a citizen of Haiti in the world that we live in internationally. I'll leave uh, uh, and Professor Shabaya, Serene Shabaya, to say some more about the issue from the U.S. now. Um, I don't have much more to add. I see there are also other questions, so maybe we can go there and I can come back to this if needed, but I thought your answer was great. Wonderful. Um, another question, and this is for Professor Vey. At the time that the US Supreme Court was building protections for citizenship um, in the decisions you discussed, what was happening in civil society? Can you speak to the general sentiment of the people about mass denaturalization and denationalization? Was it something that was widely known among the general public? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me add one uh, comment on the uh, Asian and Dominican Republic situation. I think it's a shame that uh, the Americas and the Europeans didn't react more strongly against the Dominican Republic, uh, politically, like, you know, boycotting their beaches and their tourist ministry, acting more to, 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 to because to organize 
a massive denationalization. It's something that existed as existed in the, in the first period of the first half of the European, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, 20th century, uh, with the Soviet Union uh, denationalization massively, the Nazi, etc. It's absolutely unacceptable, and it's but it's unacceptable that we didn't react more. As, a, as a, uh, you speak about civic mobilization in the U.S., uh, about, but we, we in the U.S. and the rest of the world, we didn't react to help Haiti again. We we lost an opportunity to react massively against the Dominican Republic. And if we would have done it, they would have had to repeal or to, to change their good decision or whatever. So that's my comment I wanted to make about the U.S. I would say that. In the first year after the passing of the 1906 Act, the fact that the Attorney General in 1909 sent a letter to all the US attorney not to initiate any more proceeding on denaturalization, uh, unless I quote the instruction, some substantial results are to be achieved thereby in the way of the betterment of the citizenship of the country. The legislation uh, referred to being retroactive is construed to be remedial rather than penal. So the, the, at that, time, they, that was provoked by the fact that they, under the law, they had to go to court. And as I said, probably 30 to 40% or even more of some naturalization in some state would have been canceled, provoking a big social unrest or problems or really, really a lot of problems for many, many uh, new Americans. Uh, I would say that uh, denaturalization was probably popular, uh, the program of denaturalization against Nazi America uh, in 1942 was probably popular and it was done to be popular among the public. Uh, what worked as a resistance was the Supreme Court. Uh, but the public was probably supporting uh, more denaturalization of Nazi Americans in 42. Then in the aftermath of the Second World War, I would say that the cases, you know, the cases, uh, for example, the three cases I mentioned, Justice Douglas, uh, when the, the court delivered the cases, she, he said, they are the most important constitutional pronouncement of this century. And it was after uh, Brown versus Board of Education. So the Supreme Court had the feeling of, uh, I would say, uh, that putting at risk the citizenship of our Americans if in the decision they were making. And the main, the big, the ACLU, and other American Association of Defense of, of, of the right of immigrants and uh, naturalized Americans were mobilized. And I would say it was a climate where uh, there was, it was a liberal, uh, well, it was liberal. You had also, uh, what is very interesting, it was also at the time of the McCarthyism. But here, it's very interesting. When the McCarthyism was at its height, the, the American naturalized who were communist were protected by the Schneiderman jurisprudence. So you don't you 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 don't have many you have many attempts to naturalize communist Americans naturalized, but it didn't work well because of the jurisprudence. So probably it was in some state very popular to go after the. Uh, uh, denaturalized communist, but uh, the court protected uh, uh, the, the American naturalized against the popu some popular sentiments. I would say that there was another a case that was popular was a, uh, what's the name of the, the case of this woman, this poor woman who was a refugee at four years old, then went to Smith College, and then was sent in a foreign program in Paris, uh, fall in love with a German student, live in Germany, had children, Amer uh, um, uh, American children, and then was denied a passport when she wanted to go back to the US. This case was probably 
uh, provoked a lot of re uh, social reaction because it was totally unfair that these women, uh, after being a refugee from the war, uh, lost her American citizenship and she went to court. She went, she went two times to the Supreme Court. She fought eight years. And I think so you can see that there is, uh, I, there is no, um, uh, I would say, common trend. The court has its own history that sometimes goes against diverse popular uh, sentiments. And, and I'll add in a similar vein that um, in the period of marital expatriation in, from 1907 to 1922 or to 1931, uh, in some cases, um, marital expatriation was rarely front page news until there was a major, um, it, it became a, a cause celeb. So a Supreme Court case fails in an attempt to overturn that, that system of jurisprudence or a very, very wealthy woman learns uh, that she can't get a passport, uh, or uh, if she's married to a German during World War I, uh, her property might be confiscated uh, because she's now an enemy alien in a time of war. Um, but that lack of uh, equality in how information is diffused, I think, uh, plays a major role in how and when which groups of women regain their citizenship or don't when they do. Um, the, the, the early years when after the passage of the Cable Act, it tends to be more upper middle class uh, Anglo origin women who are probably reading a major national uh, English language newspapers and this information about the provisions of the, the new regime under the Cable Act um, is, is more widely known and more working class second generation, an Italian American woman whose parents were born in Italy, she was born in the US. Um, is more likely to regain her citizenship later on in the process because she might not know uh, that she had ever lost her citizenship in the first place. Um, uh, or or if, if she is reading uh, a, a foreign language newspaper, it might not be reporting on the Cable Act and its provisions to the same level. So that would be my put it, adding that element a little bit earlier. Any other questions? Maybe if I could add that the social, economic, and political dimensions of these issues are really um, ones that invite detailed historicist analysis. Um, because there, for example, uh, Professor Bay points out very um, correctly that perhaps, contrary to the way that things have played out, if international pressure had been sustained, we might have seen a more accommodating response from the Dominican state. Following up on the Sentencia 168, you will recall that there was a very sharp international reaction. Boycotts of Dominican, um, excuse me, now my, now my phone's running out of power. Boycotts of, of Dominican tourism were, were organized. Uh, and then the Dominican legislature responded by through uh, uh, some legislation that accommodated, seemingly accommodated the, um, up, by creating a path to uh, renationalize those Dominicans who had been stripped of citizenship. But that just shows the, in a way, a kind of catch when you switch things to lawfare and that things that are matters of principle can be redefined as questions of procedure. Uh, and so at the point when the Dominican state effectively covers its uh, uh, crime by uh, saying, we're go actually going to restore these people's nationality, uh, things get caught up in a whole bunch of procedural obstacles where today still tens of thousands of these people who were stripped of citizenship have no definitive answer. A and the international community while there are real, some very dedicated uh, NGOs and international human rights law clinics that have kept on the ball for all these years, the, the public outrage has dissipated. Um, and so someday somebody's gonna look back at this and say, here's the playbook for denationalizing. Uh, and uh, 
it's a playbook that I think involved a lot of improvisation on the part of the Dominican state. There wasn't a plan, a strategy, uh, uh, and, and yet they somehow seem through the power that they have as a state to command the legal process in country seem to be winning this uh, battle with international human rights. I guess if there is an additional minute, I might add something on the kind of advocacy front. Like, um, I really think that one critical thing that needs to be done is that when there are administrations that are ostensibly friendlier, that people should go all out advocating for change because it's actually friendly administrations, quote unquote, that have started some of the worst, like Operation Jane has started under the Obama administration, not the Trump administration. The Trump ad administration just put it on steroids. So I actually think that like, in moments when there are ostensibly administrations that are more favorable, people should be pushing as hard as they can and not forgetting the issues and then coming back to them when there's a bad administration because what happens under these administrations is actually going to be really what defines um, the future of these issues. And so I actually think from an advocacy perspective, like, you know, advocating with Congress that this needs to change, advocating with the administration that they need to put in place forbearance policies or policies that really deprioritize pursuing denaturalization, raising the issue about the budget and how much money is being spent on this stupid effort. You know, um, I think all those things and also tying it back, like I think one, one framing point that I maybe kind of didn't make quite as clearly as I would have wanted at the top is these denaturalization efforts are part of the same racial justice issues that come up across the board in the immigration context, right? Like different communities are targeted in different ways because of really kind of the white supremacist origins of our immigration system, honestly, and like the, um, the remnants of that in today's immigration system. And so I think recognizing that that's the case makes it possible to also make the case to, to the Biden administration, for example, that they should live up to their commitment to racial justice by applying it equally in the immigration context and by rejecting these efforts that target people from certain, certain communities and that always disproportionately end up impacting people of color and people who are low income. I think that's a great place to, to end our conversation and thinking about how all of these different histories and, and recent developments um, inform our, our current moment. Um, so I would just like to thank all of our participants for joining and adapting to uh, challenging circumstances, whether it's a time zone across the Atlantic or a power outage. Um, uh, thank you all for, um, Thanks for, for participating in this panel. Um, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, we really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thanks, for, as Professor Martinez was saying, thanks for joining us uh, this late in the semester. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a great uh, rest of the day. And thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you to the center um, for, for affording us this opportunity. Thank you thank so you much, all. Brendan, and thank you. Thank you. Else thank, thank you. Thank you.